everyone. I hope this finds you doing well and able to see and appreciate the good things happening in your life. I invite you to visit our website at Mindset Matters Podcast One, that's the numeral one, dot com, where you can become an active participant in the podcast. Um, there's several opportunities, including leaving a voice message. Um, I need to let you know that the information for this episode came entirely from Paul Kalanithi's memoir, When Breath Becomes Air. And I have to say, this is one of the best memoirs I've read um, due to Paul's vulnerability in his writing and how he expresses the inner workings of his heart and mind so beautifully. So I hope you enjoy his story. Join us on a profound journey as we delve into the extraordinary life and legacy of Paul Kalanithi, a brilliant neurosurgeon and author of the critically acclaimed memoir, When Breath Becomes Air. In this episode, we explore the intersection of medicine, mortality, and meaning as we unravel the poignant story of a man who confronted life and death with unwavering grace and wisdom. Paul Kalanithi was born on April 1, 1977, in New York City, to a family of Indian immigrants. His parents, Sujatha and Paul, were both trained as doctors, and they instilled in Paul a deep appreciation for learning and intellectual pursuits from an early age. The Kalanithi family later moved to Kingman, Arizona, where Paul spent his childhood with his siblings, Jivan and Suman. Growing up in a small desert town, he found solace and inspiration in literature. He developed a love for reading, and his passion for books and storytelling became a significant part of his identity. This early interest in literature would later play a crucial role in shaping his worldview and influence his decision to pursue a career in writing before eventually turning to medicine. In addition to his academic pursuits, Paul was also exposed to the world of medicine through his parents. Witnessing their dedication to healing and helping others had a profound impact on him, setting the stage for his future career in the medical field. As a teenager, Paul's academic achievements were noteworthy. He graduated as valedictorian from his high school, displaying a keen intellect and a drive for excellence that would characterize his later pursuits. His journey from a bookish childhood in a small Arizona town to becoming a prominent neurosurgeon and author reflects the diverse influences that shaped his life. The intersection of his love for literature and his exposure to the medical world would eventually lead Paul to pursue degrees in both English literature and human biology. This interdisciplinary background would play a crucial role in his ability to approach medicine with a unique blend of scientific rigor and philosophical reflection. Initially drawn to literature and philosophy, Paul pursued degrees in English literature and human biology at Stanford University. His love for literature was profound, and he contemplated a future as a writer and academic. However, during his undergraduate years, he found himself increasingly intrigued by the intersection of science and humanity, particularly the complexities of the human brain. The turning point came when he enrolled in a neuroscience course during his senior year at Stanford. This course exposed him to the intricate workings of the brain and the profound impact of neurological diseases on individuals and their identities the intellectual challenge and the potential to make a tangible difference in people's lives drew him toward medicine. Recognizing the need to integrate his passion for literature with his burgeoning interest in neuroscience, Kalanithi pursued a master's degree in English literature at the University of Cambridge after completing his undergraduate studies. This period of academic exploration allowed him to deepen his understanding of the human experience through literature while also preparing him for the rigorous intellectual demands of medical school. Subsequently, Paul entered the Yale School of Medicine to pursue a medical degree. It was at Yale where he met his wife Lucy. 
The couple first met during their medical studies. Both were pursuing careers in medicine, and their shared passion for the field brought them together. As their relationship blossomed, they faced the challenges of demanding careers in medicine, with Paul pursuing neurosurgery and Lucy pursuing her training as an internist. Despite the difficulties and time constraints, their love deepened and they eventually decided to get married. Paul's residency involved long and intense hours in the operating room, where Kalanithi honed his surgical skills under the guidance of experienced mentors. The neurosurgery residency exposed him to a wide array of complex cases, ranging from intricate brain surgeries to spinal procedures. The high stakes of these surgeries, often involving life or death decisions, added a layer of pressure and responsibility to his training. Beyond the technical aspects of neurosurgery, Kalanithi's residency also delved into the ethical dimensions of medical practice. He grappled with the emotional toll of dealing with patients and their families during critical moments of illness and treatment. The delicate balance between empathy and detachment, a crucial aspect of the medical profession, became a central theme in his reflections. The demanding nature of the residency extended beyond the operating room, as Paul juggled patient care, research commitments, and academic responsibilities, often leaving him physically and mentally exhausted. Paul first started feeling unwell during the later stages of his neurosurgery residency. As a young and promising neurosurgeon on the verge of completing his training, Paul began to experience a range of symptoms that raised concerns about his health. Fatigue, weight loss, and a persistent nagging back pain were among the early signs that something was amiss. Paul initially attributed his physical decline to the demanding nature of his profession. The grueling hours and intense workload were common in the field of neurosurgery, and he, like many of his colleagues, dismissed his symptoms as a natural consequence of the demanding job. However, as the symptoms persisted and became increasingly debilitating, Paul sought medical attention. Tests and consultations with various specialists eventually led to a shocking and life-changing diagnosis, stage 4 lung cancer. This unexpected and devastating news marked the beginning of Paul's personal battle with mortality and reshaped the trajectory of his life, leading him to confront profound questions about the meaning of existence, the nature of a life well lived, and the essence of human experience. The timing of the diagnosis added another layer of complexity to Paul's experience. He was on the cusp of completing his neurosurgery residency, a period marked by grueling hours and intense professional demands. The juxtaposition of his roles as a skilled neurosurgeon and a vulnerable cancer patient highlighted the profound uncertainties and paradoxes of life and medicine. He grappled with the abrupt shift from a position of authority in the medical field to a position of vulnerability and dependence on the expertise of others. The news forced him to confront his mortality and reconsider the priorities and aspirations that had defined his life until then. As Paul underwent treatment, including surgeries and rounds of chemotherapy, he continued to reflect on the intersection of life, death, and the meaning of existence. The diagnosis became a catalyst for profound introspection and prompted him to share his insights and experiences in his memoir, leaving behind a powerful legacy that transcends his own life. Paul and Lucy faced the profound decision of whether to have a baby. The couple grappled with the uncertainty of Paul's health and the limited time they had together. The prospect of becoming parents in the face of a terminal illness added a layer of complexity to their decision-making process. They had to weigh the desire for a family against the potential challenges and responsibilities that would come with parenthood, especially given Paul's health condition. Their daughter, Katie, was born on July 4, 2014. 
the birth of their child became a symbol of hope, love, and the continuation of life, even in the face of mortality. Paul reflects in his memoir on the complexities of being a father while dealing with a terminal illness. The birth of Katie brought both joy and heartache, underscoring the bittersweet nature of life and the profound questions about legacy and the continuity of existence, adding depth to Paul's exploration of life, death, and the enduring nature of love and family. Tragically, Paul was unable to finish his memoir entitled When Breath Becomes Air. Lucy Kalanithi writes the details of his final moments and the aftermath of his passing. Lucy beautifully captures the essence of those final days, detailing the emotional challenges faced by Paul and the people around him. The narrative conveys the complexity of emotions as the family grapples with the impending loss of a beloved husband, father, and friend. After Paul's passing on March 9, 2015, Lucy reflects on the process of grieving and the efforts to preserve his memory. The epilogue delves into the aftermath of his death, exploring how Lucy coped with her grief and found ways to keep Paul's legacy alive. She concludes with a moving reflection on life, love, and the enduring impact of Paul's words. Lucy's epilogue serves as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of love to transcend the boundaries of mortality. When Breath Becomes Air is not just a memoir of illness and death, but also a celebration of life, leaving readers with profound insights into the fragility and beauty of of the human experience. We're going to listen to an audio clip that's a little longer than I normally use, but I think it's really important for us to hear Paul's own voice. In this clip that is found on Stanford's uh, YouTube channel, Paul explores the concept of time and how it had come to a screeching halt for him since his diagnosis. Um, he reflects that while in med school and residency, he'd been living on screech, going from goal to goal, um, and how time for him meant progress towards those goals. And that's uh, a lot like all of us, right? We we have these short and long-term goals, and most of our day is involved with, with doing that, with meeting those um, those goals. But since his diagnosis, his life had become about living in the moment, Um and he talks about how it's no longer about productivity for him, but about being and being in the moment, which is very profound for all of us to think about. So please take time to listen to this audio clip. Clocks are now kind of irrelevant to me. Time, we're used to have kind of the linear progression feel to it. Now feels more like a space. Asked me when I was 17, you know, what I'd be doing with my life, I would have said, Oh, I'd definitely be a writer. For me, literature was always a, a, a powerful reflecting tool for thinking about life. But found after I completed my undergraduate studies uh, and for the first time really thought about what I was passionate about, medicine was in fact the perfect place. The life of a neurosurgery resident, time is linked to progress. And as the numbers on the clock increase, so too should your progress towards some goal. I first began noticing symptoms in my sixth year of residency. And so I ended up having a full body CT scan. And yeah, and there were uh, metastatic lesions gone and all over the place. Obviously, Lucy and I were both very suspicious that I had some form of cancer, but actually having the confirmation was still devastating. And so we were in the hospital room, and we just kind of lived there and cried a little bit, and then called my parents, my brothers. 
after finishing chemotherapy and coming out of the hospital and entering this recuperative phase and not working, time is very different where I'm not thinking about how each 15 minutes is going to contribute to some greater productivity. Verb conjugation is particularly confusing for me for the verb to be. I finished neurosurgical training, so I am a neurosurgeon. I'm not practicing currently. If I get healthier, I plan on getting back into clinical medicine. So in that sense, I will be a neurosurgeon, or I won't, depending on how things go. And so I don't really know what the correct tense to use is. I am, I was, I will be, I had been. There's definitely a funny double sense I have at, say, clinic visits. As a physician, you're constantly concerned about how far behind you're getting and how many patients you have to see. And the faster you can get through your appointments, the better. And so, you know, whenever I see a doctor, there's always an awareness in my head that a little clock in the back of their heads is ticking. Certainly, medical training is very future-oriented because it's all about delayed gratification. And so you're always thinking about five years down the line, what are you going to be doing? Five years down the line, I don't know what I'll be doing. I may be dead, I may not be. And so it's not all that useful to spend a lot of time thinking about the future beyond lunch. her has had a, a very peculiar and free nature. In all probability, I won't live long enough for her to remember me or certainly not have any clear memory of me. And so, you know, the time is just is what it is, which is fun because she's a really good baby. disjunction in time between how I perceive time and how I perceive my daughter Katie's time because she's in this rapid phase of development whereas my sense of time is very static and so there is kind of a inherent tension between those things but you know sometimes when I'm reading a baby book or someone remarks kids grow up so quickly there's kind of a pang because I'm not gonna see most likely that growing up happen. And the faster Katie grows up, the, the faster I'm not there. At the same time, every day is an exciting, rewarding, meaningful time to spend with her. is a very funny thing. Certainly as a doctor, I felt it was very important. And the way in which patients come to understand and make meaning of their diseases is one of the pillars of, of what matters about being a doctor. And the way hope functions for me now as a patient, it's a careful balance. If you don't think about the bad case, that ending is going to be very rough on you and your family. But if you're going to think about the good case, you're going to miss an opportunity to really make the most out of, out of your, your life and time. I met a traveler from an ancient land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read would yet survive, 
stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone level sands stretch far away. In listening to Paul speak, um, I was reflecting on my own life a bit and how I tend to get caught up in the um, day-to-day, you know, trying to knock off things off my list and uh, achieving goals and setting new goals and um, how important it is to be in the moment and enjoy the moments that we have. And that's actually a biblical principle um, when God teaches us that today is the day we have. Um, and we don't need to worry about tomorrow. So I, I really just appreciated that clip from Paul. The quote of the day comes from him and his memoir. Uh, he says, there is a moment, a cusp, when the sum of gathered experience is worn down by the details of living. We are never so wise as when we live in this moment. Thank you for taking your time to listen to Mindset Matters, The Courage to Continue, and I hope you enjoyed today's podcast and that it meant something to you. Please send your hero heart stories from your corner of the world to Mindset Matters Podcast 1, that's the number one, at gmail.com. Our next episode, we will explore the hero heart of foster care parents, so I hope to see you then. Thank you for giving your time to listen to this episode of Mindset Matters, The Courage to Continue. You are of value. You are loved. You are not alone. If you are struggling with thoughts of suicide, help is available. Dial 988 24 hours a day for free confidential support. If you are not in crisis but need support, please feel free to reach out to me at the email Mindset Matters Podcast numeral one at gmail.com. Again, that's all lowercase mindset matters podcast, the numeral one at gmail.com. Remember to change your day by what you think and say. We'll see you next time.